1961, July of that year, my parents moved to the northwest side of Flint. We moved from Mount Clemens. And before they rented the house at 5001 Miami Lane in Manly Village, they went to see if there would be room at St. Agnes School. Now, St. Michael's Byzantine Rite Catholic Church was only a block away, but we weren't Byzantine. We were Roman Catholic, so we went eight blocks further to St. Agnes. And my parents knocked on the door of the rectory and met Father Oak, a great man, a saint, a real saint. And they asked him, you know, is there room in the school for their kids? A and there was, except for me. <laughs> the fifth grade was full. And my parents obviously must have looked disappointed because my parents turned around and, you know, kind of had this downcast look. And Father Oak said, Mr. and Mrs. Howell, if I have to move that desk into the room myself, your son will be in fifth grade. So they signed the lease and we moved to Flint. About a month later, we started, and I was placed in Mrs. Kimmel's fifth grade at St. Agnes. And I loved her. She was a great teacher. And the thing I loved most about her is that back in the olden days, a few of you who are my age or around there and went to Catholic school know that every morning you went to Mass. You know, that's where you started. And then from there, you went back to school, and then you had religion class. And religion class was not terribly exciting back in the olden days. We didn't do crafts. We didn't do fun things. We learned catechism. And so there were a series of questions and answers that needed to be memorized as the year progressed. So who is God? God is a supreme being. Who made you? God made me. Why did God make me? God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him, this world, be happy with him in the next. How many sacraments are there? There are seven sacraments. You know, it was this rote kind of memory thing. But Mrs. Kimmel was a grandmotherly type of person who had a veritable treasure trove of stories. And so every day for religion class, she would tell us a story to illustrate the point. And I loved the stories. I loved those stories. And so up until fifth grade, I was not a great student. I was kind of lackadaisical. I could find an excuse to get out of school. <laughs> I took it. You know, a little bit of fever. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. You know, but not when I hit fifth grade. It didn't matter. I went to school sick because I wanted to hear the story Mrs. Kimmel would tell us today. And, and her stories changed my life. Not that I remember any of them, but... I do remember how attractive that was to me and, and how much it made what she was trying to teach real. And I never missed a day of class in fifth grade. In fact, I never missed a day of school again until sophomore year of college when I had pneumonia and had to go to the infirmary. Literally had to go. You know, it just it changed my life and my attitude. I love those stories. Jesus knew the power of story. You know, again and again, that's what we get. You know, why do you speak to the people in parables, in stories? Why do you use these images? You know, why don't you just give us the rules? Tell us the law. Give it to us. No, no. He didn't do that. In fact, interestingly enough, Jesus only gave us one law, one commandment. And that was at the very end, at his last supper, he said, love one another as I have loved you. That was it. Just one. How simple is that? <laughs> Except when we try to put it into practice. But it's simple. Just one rule, one command. You know, it's an amazing thing. But he tells us parables and stories to teach us what that means to love. He'll talk about people like a good Samaritan who finds someone who's beaten along the road. He tells us stories about 
mustard seeds and dough that's needed by a woman that rises to become something so much more. He uses images from everyday life to teach us. In fact, Jesus was a great storyteller, and in fact, his whole life is a parable. You know, it's a parable of love. People will say, well, why don't we know about the early life of Jesus? Because it wasn't important. It wasn't until he began his ministry that it really became real. That's where he taught us what it means to love. And as we see his life unfold through a series of experiences and events, again and again, that love of God is revealed in him in his care for the poor, the marginalized, the forgotten, those who live at the edge of society. We see that again and again. The love of God is made real. And at the very end of his life, when he would sit at table with his disciples, at that same table where he would give us his only command, he would take the bread of affliction. The Last Supper was the Passover. And he took that bread of affliction, that unleavened bread, and he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body broken for you. This is me, whose life, whose very body is broken to give you life. And then he took the third cup, which is called in the Passover meal, the cup of salvation. And he said, now, I want you to drink from my cup this time, not from your own, but from mine. For this is the cup of my blood, my very life poured out into you. He would reveal to us in those two actions the whole meaning of his life and what would occur the next day when he would offer his life to the Father on the altar of the cross. He all made it real. This is what love really is. And he would say, do this in memory of me. He wasn't talking about a ritual so much as a way of living, of self-giving, of loving. That is the word of God. That is who Jesus is, is that love of God made real. And he gives us the gift of himself. You know, in a few minutes, you and I are going to come forward and we receive the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. The word made flesh that came to dwell among us, now will come to dwell within us so that it might bring forth a harvest. But the question is, what kind of soil will that word find? Will we be like the one along the footpath who hears it and, oh, oh, yeah, that sounds good to me. And that's about the end of it. Or maybe the one on rocky soil that yeah, that sounds great. And then it's out into the parking lot and almost runs somebody over as they're trying to get out ahead of somebody else. Or are the we on the one that takes the word and says, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then Monday morning, the anxieties and the cares of the world somehow press in and I forget what I am and who I'm supposed to be. And it all gets forgotten and choked out. Or am I that good soil that brings forth a harvest of 30 or 60 or 100-fold? An amazing response. You know, St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans that all creation is awaiting the revelation of God's children. He wants to see the love of God made real in this world. It says that all creation is subject to futility, that all creation is slowly decaying, it's falling apart. And so we see that in the world we live where there are tornadoes and hurricanes and heat domes, whatever those are, I never heard of those until just a few years ago. All of creation is falling apart, but it's waiting for the children of God to be revealed because then the children of God in love will care for this world, will care for one another, will care for those who live at the edges of society that somehow this world will be made what God called it to be, fashioned it to be. The kingdom of God will be at hand if that love of God is lived out. St. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, says that love is simple. It's not what we feel. 
It's what we do. He said love is patient, love is kind. It's never rude or boastful or arrogant. It doesn't seek its own way, but it's always ready to forgive. Love never ends. It's eternal. All of creation, my sisters and brothers, the entire universe is waiting for you and me to see what we will do with that gift we receive today. How the Lord will take root in our lives and what it will bring forth in the way it will touch the lives of others, not just our family or those we know, but will make this world a better place. Will somehow end the decay and the destruction that each in our own way, in our own little way, it doesn't matter how big it is, do something to make this world a better place. All of creation is watching and waiting to see what we're going to do with the gift we receive today. That gift planted in our lives, how will we make it grow to become something more? The universe is watching. It's an awesome thought. How will we grow in Christ and the love we celebrate this day and bring that out there to a world that desperately needs to see it?